uh, as for sports, yes, I definitely saw this coming to the point where I could see mistakes that people were going to make a month before they started making the mistakes. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but, um, as I understand the process, a lot of these universities are saying to everybody, you know, we had a huge revenue hole, so you all need to cut your expenses 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever the number is. And there's, it's a particular spot where problems in sport, athletic department accounting, um, operate differently than a normal academic department that generates very little revenue. And almost all of its expenses are real hard money expenses. They're not intra uh, departmental, intra university cross department spending, which is, you know, for your department in, in communications, for, for someone in the history department, you know, the money comes in based on how many survey courses you teach or whatever. That's an allocation from a central pot. And then your expenses are, what are your salaries? What are your, um, what kind of grants are you giving to your researchers to go overseas? It's all about money flowing out of the university. Athletics is completely different. The bulk of the money that's flowing, not the bulk, but a big chunk of the money flowing into an athletic department is from the outside, uh, depending on which school we're at. And a big chunk of the expenses flowing out are to pay for scholarships. I don't know, but I doubt that the communications department budget at, at the department at Ohio State has a very large undergraduate scholarship program where you're actively paying for freshman uh, tuition. Is it? Do you? We have right, a so, program, but we don't pay freshmen to come to college. No. Right, but <laughs> athletic departments do, and so it's a it's it's a fundamental problem, and you know, it's it sucks to be Cassandra, the profit test mm -hmm. who who is always right and never listened to. But, um, you know, you could see the way that these schools think about their expense, not the schools, the athletic departments think about their expenses, leading to them cutting expenses that actually harm the university. And that's exactly what's playing out. Not with every sport in every school, but at a lot of sports, at a lot of schools. So Dave, you know, you've had so much um, experience and knowledge about this. Um, what what is you know recognizing that COVID obviously accelerated a lot of things you know Title IX has been thrown out quite a bit in terms of a cause and effect um, from this can you kind of talk to us about the intersection of COVID and Title IX and the growth of athletic departments and the expenses of athletic departments and how they're kind of making this perfect storm perhaps well it really is a perfect storm and, and Jack I, I'm sorry too I mean I think you have to look at this not just as an athletic issue, but as a, a higher education issue. Certainly at Ohio University, um, we were being told back in December and January that the apocalypse was coming and nobody even knew about the virus, at least in America. So we were already having issues. And like Andy said, with birth rates and, and other things like that, I mean, higher education itself probably needs a bit of a reset. And uh, what is it offering? And you know, what types of majors, let's just take the state of Ohio, Nicole, that, you know, perhaps we should look at, and I know this has been done to an extent by the Higher Education Learning Commission, and I don't know if Andy can speak to California, but from a public school perspective, you know, should we have journalism programs at all 25, 30 plus public schools that we have in Ohio, or should we have it at a few schools and they do it quite well? Um, same with sports management or literature or whatever, and, and really maybe kind of reconfigure it from that perspective. Of course, that doesn't include, you know, the privates like a, like an Urbana used to be or a Worcester or something like that. Um, from an athletic perspective, and, you know, Title IX is an interesting uh, issue, Nicole, in that it really does not have enforcement. People talk about the, the fear of, of Title IX, but it really is a settlement. It's really a settlement being forced. Nobody has come in and shut down an athletic department or anything because of Title IX violations. And there's really many ways, as you know, Nicole, to, to kind of, you know, skirt around it. I think the number one thing is for me that bothers me is that it's always used as an excuse. It's like, well, we had to drop this sport because of Title IX. Right. And that is, one, we should be doing that. And there's also a, a huge amount of fat <laughs> and a lot of unnecessary excess that we have in college athletics that can, if we trim that down, we can still have a robust athletic department, but save other sports. And I'm a former Division I wrestling coach, so I'm very sensitive to this. Um, 
for those in Ohio, and I, I know Andy knows this just as he keeps up on it, but I was very pleased. And I don't give the Mid-American Conference a whole heck of a lot of credit, but uh, John Steinbrecher and the, and the Mid-American Conference did a great thing by saying, across the board, we're going to stop home hotel nights for football teams. Right. Look, Ohio State can afford to do that, whether I think it's right or not. That's just my, my opinion. If we're dropping sports, but yet we're spending between seventy dollars and $100,000 on home hotel nights at a Mid-American Conference school, that's a problem. Right. And, what, and, what, and we shouldn't be doing that. So th those are things that can be done. Right. Well, Io, welcome. It is a, bit, a great pleasure to see you. Um, and you, uh, well, you've gone through, I, I'm guessing, a, quite a bit of a roller coaster here. So you are at Alabama Huntsville, and your program was a limit. You, of course, play hockey there. Um, but now I understand that uh, GoFundMe has enabled that program to come back for a year. Is that the right now? Yes. Um, it was weird because originally I was told before I came here that we had one year left in our conference before we kind of left our conference and tried to figure out somewhere else to go. But I'm pretty sure that the school tried to use coronavirus as kind of an excuse to eliminate our program. But our... Our community loved our hockey program so much that they put out a GoFundMe. The community raised half a million dollars and then it was matched through GoFundMe to give us another season. That's fantastic. So we, you know, Jack's on here with us and uh, he, he was at Urbana, which, which the university closed. I mean, I know um, I, I had the privilege of knowing your journey of uh, going through, uh, you know, being in Columbus, playing junior hockey at such a high level. And then you make this determination that you're going to play division one hockey at Alabama Huntsville. I'm sure that was not uh, taken lightly. Can you kind of walk us through the sequence of how you started to hear rumblings that they were contemplating canceling the, the program itself and, and kind of what the emotional um, toll is on a player when that happens. Um, it actually came out of nowhere. It was weird because knowing coming into this season, I thought, you know, this may be my last year, but we're going to find a different conference to play in after that. But believe it or not, I actually figured out the news via Twitter. So I'm just scrolling through and it says, Sorry to announce that the University of Alabama Huntsville has foregone their hockey program. And I called my mom. I'm like, is this fake news? Is this just Twitter news? And I get a call from my coach maybe 15, 20 minutes later. And he's like, yep, they cut our program. We didn't know it was coming. It was from people above us, that type of thing. So it was, it was, it was, it was different to say what's, the least. What's the first thing you do? I mean, you know, before the GoFundMe, at that point, are you looking for another team? What are you, what are you doing exactly? Um, I reached out. I have an advisor. I reached out to him. I was like, I know you've seen the news. I'm still trying to continue to play. Can you help me out? So I reached out to him. I reached out to my old coaches. I reached out to almost every hockey connection I had. And they helped me uh, get in contact with uh, four Division three schools and seven other Division one schools. So a whole bunch of the schools told me, like, if you don't have a program, we'll take you on, you can play, but it's late in the recruiting season. We don't know if we can give you money. So like, that's a big part too, because going into the Alabama, Alabama Huntsville, I had scholarship money. Right. So coming out of school, not paying for school is actually really important. So it was, it was kind of just swept out under the rug. I was like, what am I going to do? I had all this thought that I was going to come out of school without having to pay for anything and it just got wiped away. I'm glad that everything's uh, back in place now, but it was, it was scary. Absolutely. Well, Jack, I mean, you, you were in the ultimate, as Andy pointed out, you know, this is an even more dramatic story. The idea that you, your university itself no longer existed. What, what do you do next? I mean, what's the, what's the first step that you start to take after this round of realization starts to sink in? Um, so for me personally, like the first person I talked to, um, was my old club, club coach at like Advancement Academy in Columbus. Um, he obviously helped me along the way and he was like, you know, I'm not going to let you like give up on the sport because nobody else has an opportunity. He's like, I'm going to find a, like the best place possible for you. So like we just started, we made like a recruiting spreadsheet, talked to a bunch of coaches, like AO said, he like bunch of coaches like they're late in the recruiting process so like half of them are like sorry we don't have any athletic money or sorry like we don't have any room on the roster so it kind of it kind of left me kind of stuck but thankfully I found a good place at home at Queens University in Charlotte so at the end of the day I came out well that's fantastic 
where is this going? I mean, it, it seems like for those people who maybe were not paying as close of attention as Dave and Andy, you were, um, this seems to be coming out of the blue, but I think we're all waiting for the next, I, I don't feel like it's a shoe anymore. I'm feeling like there's going to be a building that drops on our heads. So what, where do you see us going from an athletic standpoint? Is this the beginning of an avalanche of programs that get cut? Are we, you know, here at Ohio State, we have 36 sports. Is that sustainable across time and space for programs like ours? What do you think, Andy? I, I, this may be naive of me, but I generally think that if a school is allocate, you know, even even a school as large and as well resourced as Ohio State, there's always more demands on the money than there is money. There's always some other thing that can be done to push the mission of the overall mission of the university forward to grow the university's prestige, to improve education, to improve service to the community, all the things that, that you're trying to do as an institution. And every program should be judged as to whether the cost of it um, is worth it. That's not a, is it profitable? Because generally speaking, hardly anything on campus is profitable. You're a nonprofit for one thing, but, but it's about spending money to achieve a non, non-financial outcome, education, service, et cetera. And to the extent to which um, a, uh, one of the, the, the lesser, um, less watched sports, I don't really like the term non-revenue because all of these sports generate revenue of one sort or another. We call um, Olympic now, revenue and Olympic. Yeah, the only reason I, that bothers me is that basketball is an Olympic sport. That's true. Um, uh, and I'm a stickler for words. So uh, the less well, um, less, less uh, attended sports, um, uh, to the extent to which one of them is judged not to be worth the cost, in a, in a holistic overall sense, I think schools should cut them. I think schools should have been able to say to their head coach, you can't stay in a hotel on the night before a home game without talking to their peers. They should be grownups. <laughs> um, but it's clear that sometimes that there are, they're not, and it's difficult. What I, all I would hope is that, is that in that process of, and, and I think this is true of academic departments too, you know, I, I was a history major and there are some schools, it's, it shocked me to know this, don't offer history as a major. Um, there's enough diversity in the United States that at least that there are many, and, and I hope that people, I hope that always remains the case. Um, but like the thing I would ask is that when you're making cuts, just please don't be dumb about it, and understand the real, understand the, the real costs, understand the real financial benefits, and then make a good assessment of what the non-financial benefits are. Um, and I think too many times you get sort of a bean counter answer. If, you know, if the bean counter answer is, well, you're not earning as much money as you're generating, then, you know, just say goodbye to, the, to every humanity on campus. Right. And we don't do that because we say, well, 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 wait, wait, there's a mission. And so that should apply for athletics too. And if it doesn't apply for athletics, then it opens up a deeper question that, I, you know, of why do you have it on campus if it's not consistent with your mission? Right. Well, Dave, it seems like one of the incredible challenges here is even if a, if a school does decide it's going to ultimately eliminate one of the sports that makes less revenue, you can't, you, you can't do it by attrition. Like, you can't just weed it out until your students graduate. You know, you, you have to field the team until you don't. And so invariably, some students are going to be in the position of these two guys, which is they had a a team and they had a home and then it gets eliminated. So how do you create equity in this scenario, um, especially when the people making decisions may not be the ones who are thinking about the impact that sport has on, on the humans who play it? Well, and I, I agree with Andy. I think, you know, that it shouldn't be completely off the table, but it should be, as I always say, the last thing. If you look at the athlete experience and the athlete opportunity, as the most important thing as you should, then dropping a team should be the last thing on the table. And also you can look at potentially how to maybe restructure the team so that you can still afford it and not get rid of those opportunities. But, you know, Andy and I have been doing some work, you know, with Akron 
And, and Andy's done some seminal work in this, that when you drop a sport, you may think that you are saving money, but you're actually hurting the university in the long run because those Olympic sports, as we call them, many of those kids are paying tuition. Right. Uh, as opposed to football, men's basketball, or women's basketball, and tennis, which is a just an internal you know transfer of money. So that payment of tuition you know goes to the university bottom line, and enrollment is a very big issue. And as you know, we get SSI uh, from the state, uh, Nicole, as a public school, and that's based upon enrollment. So losing those kids from just an enrollment perspective is is quite damaging. So my thing is is that you cut from the top, not from the bottom. Look at the excess. And then also look at, and, and for IO, I don't want you to get upset over this, but I am going to use an example that um, many years ago when Miami of Ohio um, dropped uh, wrestling. Now, I was part of a team that looked at that. They dropped wrestling and a few other sports. Um, and we looked at Miami, and I think you have to look at the school, right? I mean, I know Alabama Huntsville does not play Division I FBS football, so that's a different different scenario. But and Nicole knows this better than anyone, and I hope Nicole doesn't throw something at me because her kids were very much involved in hockey. But we well, said to the Iowa, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, we 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 uh, said to the president of Miami that draw a hundred mile circle around Oxford, Ohio. How many high schools sponsor wrestling? How many high schools sponsor Division One hockey? And our argument was at the level Miami is trying to sustain Division One FBS football and Division One hockey was a bridge too far. Now, their argument was, well, hockey is, is very popular. It is amongst the students, as Nicole knows, but they don't have a great season ticket base. So we tried to make that argument to say that, and kind of like I was saying about majors, Nicole, is maybe we need to look at it a little bit more regionally. Now, again, you could make the argument, and I own, I'm, I'm not making this because I have seen Alabama Huntsville play hockey in the Von Braun Center, and it's a lot of fun. The same argument would be that, well, hey, there's not a lot of high schools in Alabama playing hockey, but it is a very popular sport. Um, but it would be very tough for Alabama Huntsville to try to play at the level of the Crimson Tide and also try to support Division I hockey. Those are your two most expensive sports, primarily because of recruiting, right? Because you're bringing in a lot of international students and other things and the travel and far-flung conferences. So um, I just think there's other ways to do it. One quick example, I'm working with the National Wrestling Coaches Association. Old Dominion wanted to drop wrestling, and the, our proposal was – Keep wrestling as a non-scholarship sport. There's a Division Three conference, Bucknell and other schools like that that have Division Three wrestling. As a Division One program, you can be in another division in up to two sports. And the response from Old Dominion was, no, we want to be excellent in everything. And if we're not Division One in everything, somehow that takes away from the institution. And I think that's a, that's a cop-out. I think it's more of saying, we still want to spend excess on football rather than even preserving a sport at a much less expensive level. Well, and you know, I, you brought up the idea of, of scholarship, um, which is so important to student athletes, but we do have a lot of student athletes and, and Jack, you know, I don't put you on the spot, but um, a lot of D3 programs, of course, they're not paying student athletes. So, you know, when you two are looking at um, kind of the importance of sport and you're looking at it in two different ways, and I, I know, you know, your hopes and dreams lie in the NHL. And Jack, you know, I'm not sure where your hopes and dreams lie from an athletic standpoint, and maybe you can tell us that. But if, you're, if the hope and dream is just to continue to play your sport as long as you can, even though that may not be professional aspirations, is that a space that colleges need to be funding or should we just go to club sports altogether and not have to worry about scholarship and athletic funding and those kind of things. What, what would the two of you say to that? Jack, maybe you could start us. Um, for me personally, um, I, you know, I think, I don't think it would be a good idea to like take all sports to club sports. Cause I just don't feel like the competitive nature is there when you play club sports. I've heard from other schools, like a few of my old teammates went to like OU and they're like, you know, we're playing club volleyball and like half the guys are showing up hungover and there's not really much of a structure and stuff like that. So I don't think doing the club sports, but like I would understand like if specifically for my sport, like if they're like, all right, we can't offer any more scholarships, but like we'll still play like big division one teams like Ohio State and like Penn State and stuff like that. I feel like you could still bring in a decent amount of revenue and I bet you like majority of the students that went to those schools would just go regardless of the place, like for like the love of the game. Right. Personally. What about you, Ian? 
more for me my thing i look at it statistically kind of because if you look statistically there aren't even a whole lot of professional well not professional we'll say nhl athletes that come out of even division three sports right so it's kind of all or nothing in an aspect of if you're not playing division one hockey and even like alabama huntsville the last division one, I mean, the last professional athlete they had was Cam Talbot. That was years ago. They send a lot of kids to the ECHL, some to the American League. It's just, it's more of a network. So if you're going from a division three realm, they may have one kid that gets sent to the AHL in five years. So it kind of, I feel like it has to stay around if that's your network. But then again, as you said, if you're trying to play just for fun, there's nothing against going to play club sports. So. The interesting thing, though, is, and then I know you know you know this as well as I do, that for years hockey players did not go to college, right? If you were good enough to play high level hockey, and that would include even you know playing um, certainly high level juniors is still that, this way, but even if you want to move into the professional ranks, you didn't have to go to college. Now the colleges has kind of co opted that and said now we want hockey players to go to college, but they're going to cut programs because hockey's a fortune. How do you remedy? I mean, what's the reconciliation on that, Andy? Not to put you on um, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my understanding is that it's separate from NCAA rules that limit what athletes can earn in hockey. There's also a very restrictive pay system in, in junior hockey. There's territorial divisions. You, if you grow up in certain states, you have to go to one of three uh, junior hockey leagues. So there's cartels everywhere. And, um, and when you have that, you end up being inefficient and you end up um, probably having bloated expenses. And so it's, it's a bad thing. And I wish that our antitrust authorities took young people's employment opportunities, and educational opportunities as seriously as other elements of uh, societal justice. But we could say that about a lot of other things for, for people as well. That's not just a... <laughs> You know, in some sense, that's kind of trivial compared to the other stuff that's going on right now. Um, but, you know, it's, I, 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 think, I think the answer is that if going to college is important to you, the most important thing to you, it's probably still a better deal to go to one of these programs. If becoming a professional in any sport is the most important thing to you, increasingly, I don't think college is the right way to go. As some of the people watching this might know, I'm involved in something called the Professional Collegiate League. And we see D1 basketball as increasingly failing future NBA athletes. Uh, coaches put athletes in the wrong position because they'll play a position up in college and they really will play. So for four, two or three or four years, they're learning the wrong skills. Um, we have they, centers and things like that. Yeah, a center is really a, a maybe a, a you know a small forward in the NBA, right? Um, uh, and he's not being allowed to develop the the, the ball handling skills and the, the shooting skills. Um, but at the same time, and at the same time, depending on the sport, the 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 calendar really gets in the way of this travel calendar gets in the way of actually taking advantage of that ac that academics. Uh, so, um, you know, my, my suggestion would be we should have much more systems where you're a student during the school year and you're an athlete when you're not in school during the summer, if you can manage that, which is our model, and get the best of both worlds. But in the absence of that, you know, I would never say to anybody, well, D1 is shrinking, so don't go to college. If you want to go to college, like Io said, the, you know, getting his, his education in exchange for his services, let's not confuse this with free, getting, getting his education paid for as in-kind compensation for his services is oftentimes a good trade. You want to play the sport anyway. Um, somebody wants you to play the sport. They want to sell tickets for people to come watch you play the sport. That can be the best deal. But for other people, if it's going to involve, you know, essentially being a walk-on, being a D3 student, paying your way are you really if you're paying your way and then you're going to be playing hockey all the time are you really getting what you're paying for that's a great question 
Uh, Elizabeth has a great question that, you know, I, I know, uh, I, I think I heard this, that you had professional hockey players contribute to the, the GoFundMe, is that right? You're muted. You're muted. I do that all the time. Yes, I did, yes. yes. So who contributed to that? Um, Cam Talbot was a big contributor. I don't know specifically who contributed, but I know uh, Jonathan Taves put it up. Um, JT Brown put it up. There was a whole bunch of athletes that at least tried to use their platform to help us, which That's is good. Awesome. So Dave, the, her, Elizabeth's question is, should pro sports be helping support college sports programs? You know, I mean, this obviously was a heroic endeavor that needed to be met, but since they're dependent on institutions to develop athletes, should they be contributing and taking some burden off of athletic departments? Uh, to me, I've always, I've always said yes. If you're, if you're going to use the educational space as a primary sport, elite sport development model, um, the professional sports leagues should be contributing more. I mean, you know, let's face it, we, we talk about something that, that is actually free, and it really is the, the minor league of the NBA and NFL and, and even in other sports, even though, you know, baseball and hockey do have their own minor league system. As you know, Nicole, I'm a big fan of developmental leagues outside of the space. I like what Andy, love what Andy's doing with the, with the PCL. Um, you know, I wish the, I wish the pandemic wouldn't have been, cause I do think the XFL had some potential. Um, but that having those excess, not excess alternative leagues would be very helpful. We're taking some stress off the, uh, educational space, but I've always thought, and, and somebody much bigger than me thought the same thing when I saw her speak and it was Michelle Obama saying that she thought the professional leagues, not just, not just in higher education but in scholastic sports and youth sports had an obligation to contribute this largest to the uh, sports system, which is you know, similar to what you see in Europe and other countries. Well, Jack, I, I, just from my experience of understanding volleyball and, and forgive my ignorance that I don't know that much, um, you know, there's a lot of club sport activity, which your parents pay for. Uh, I'm sure that's in the time that you've been playing volleyball in Iowa. I, I know this firsthand because I know your mother so well, um, how much money she invested in your ability to play hockey. Um, you know, and, and part of that, I think, was the expectation or the hope that you would get a college scholarship or that you would get opportunity in college. And do you kind of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but at what point do you feel like maybe you've been sold this bill of goods that if all these, you know, these um, pay to play developmental opportunities that are, you know, the AAU and, and the, you know, and all travel hockey and all those things. But then when you ultimately get to college, you have this potential, I think, moving forward that the programs could just go away. How does that affect your perspective of the pay to play moving forward as through your childhood? You're asking me or you're asking him? I gotta start with you, Iowa. Your, your, your mic is on. <laughs> okay. Um, more, can you ask the question one more time? I'm sure. sorry. Sure. So I know how much money your mother, who I adore, mm -hmm. spent for you to play hockey. And, you know, there's always been that line that says, well, if you spent that much money in travel hockey and your, your coach, John Hofferman, has said it, you'd be better off just putting it in a college account and yep. paying to go to college. But a lot of people don't do that. They pay for these travel opportunities and they want their kids to have the chance to get a college scholarship. But now you got a college scholarship and your program was this far from being eliminated and Jack, yours was completely eliminated. Is it worth it? Was it worth it? Would they have been better off just putting the money in a fund for you and not worrying about having to play for money in college? Honestly, it's a really, that's a tough question to answer because one, it depends on your abilities. It depends on your will and your drive, but it also just depends on situation and circumstance. But more than anything. You got muted again. Is that your mother calling you? <laughs> How do I know? Um, more than anything, I would say that you have to read the signs more than anything. Like if I wasn't playing high level junior hockey by the time I was 17, I would have probably said, you know what? I'm kind of wasting my money. I should probably be spending this money on school. And I've seen a whole bunch of friends do that. And at the same time, you get kind of sad because you're like, don't give up on the dream. But if you know you can't get there, you're kind of just wasting your money. So I don't, it, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough. I, I mean, Jack, I, you know, I owe, and, and, and I, you know, the NHL is a quantifiable financial sum of money, but professional volleyball, less so. So when you see kind of the investment that was made from that perspective, 
was it worth it or would you be better off kind of separating your athletics and your academics and not worrying about college being a, a pathway for athletics? Um, you know, for me personally, I think like for how much money like my mom spent on like my clubs, like half of that, like it's just like memories that you make and like people that you meet is the journey, obviously. Um, you know, nothing beats sports and like competing with like your brothers, you know, you'll have those guys for the rest of your life. But like for me personally, especially since like volleyball is not as developed, like professionally, like NHL or NFL and stuff like that, like there is the opportunity to go play overseas. But, like, from what I've heard from, like, people's different experiences, they don't really pay that well. They basically just pay for your, like, living expenses and maybe, like, you get, like, a $1,000 check a week. So, like, majority of those guys, unless you're, like, an Olympian, they really just do it for the love of the game and they usually have, like, a second profession backed up. So, like, that's where they can kind of use their college education more than, like, an NHL athlete where he would just be, like, I'm going to go to college and then eventually I'm just going to go play NHL and then I'll be good for the rest of my career. Right. Why, while you got to, like, kind of take the college experience. Actually, like, not more seriously, but, like, you actually have to, like, have a backup plan ready in case, like, an, like an injury or, like, it doesn't work out. Absolutely. Uh, so, Dave, you know, we just spent three weeks talking about name, image, and likeness. And um, how might this affect sports and the elimination of sports? Well. I tend to think, and I think Andy agrees with me on this, I don't think it's going to have any effect at all if it's, if it's managed correctly. Um, it, if the athletes are able to negotiate these deals on their own and it's completely outside of the university structure, which is what the Knight Commission was saying earlier on a webinar today that they're favoring, um, and certainly the Drake Group, which I'm a member of, favors a, you know, a third party oversight, uh, if anything, um, but not the schools being involved. So that wouldn't affect Title IX and those types of things. The fear is by many athletic directors is my budget is going to be impacted because money is now going to go from my pot straight to the athlete by sponsors and things like that. I think that that's a possibility, but again, to me, it comes, it comes at what we all have to deal with. If we have to spend money or we're in debt, whatever it may be, we cut expenses or we go, try to make more money, those types of things. And college athletics does a great job of generating revenue. They do a terrible job of managing it, in my view. And I just think that this is another, uh, if it is going to have an impact on budgets, I'm not convinced, this is more Andy's thing, but I'm not convinced it's gonna be a huge, huge hit. I'm afraid they might use it as an excuse though, to say, well, you know, these kids are out there siphoning money from us, so we've got to cut the wrestling team, where, where they could just do simple things like cut home hotel nights and things like that to save a wrestling team. So um, I think it's gonna be used primarily more as an excuse rather than a real reason uh, to drop sports. You threw that one in your court, Andy. Yeah, I wanna be a little bit contrarian. I think that the schools are managing, <coughs> managing to set up a system that's going to shrink the pot. Um, there's a way to do NIL that grows the, the pool and is win-win and they are finding their way to the lose-lose. Um, so, for example, if um, Dak Prescott does an ad without a Dallas Cowboys uniform on, he's worth less, that ad is worth less. If you put the Dallas Cowboys uniform out on the floor without Dak Prescott in it, it's worth less, too. You put Dask, Dak Prescott in the Cowboys uniform and, and um, Chunky Soup pays more than they would for either of those options alone, and then you have a question about who gets what. And in the professional sports, they – they figure this out in a way that's win-win. Uh, they make sure that both sides get what they would get on their own, and then they divide the surplus up. And 50-50 ends up being a nice, nice way to do it. But you know, it's not always the case in, in, um, in Madden, in the football game, the NFL gets twice as much as the players union does, because that's the way the bargaining went. But the players union is still happier than if there were no game, which is what happened in the NCAA. Again, lose-lose. Um, so, what the proposal, as I understand it, is, is that no athlete can be in any form of endorsement that is also uh, using the marks of the school, even if it's negotiated separately, which means you're destroying all that that win-win value. Right. Pool, the pool has just gotten, the, event, the potential for the pool to grow has just gotten removed. Now, when you're out in the community and you want to do an ad right now and you are 
Alabama football, there's only going to be one official car dealership of Alabama football. But there could be the official car dealership of Alabama football and the official car dealership of the quarterback of Alabama and the, the running back and the wide receiver. What's going to happen to the price of an official sponsorship? It's going to go down. Right. So now the school is making less money. The, if, if instead they had partnered, and so it would be the official car dealership of Alabama football featuring all these players, it would be a much va more valuable single, single source deal. So why are they doing this? They're doing this because I think because the schools don't like Title IX, not because, not because they, they um, are, cons what they're worried about is that they might have to share some of this male money with women. Well, that's a great question. And I wanted to segue to that because as you notice, two of our guests here are men. Um, I, my son had another classmate, Jack, another classmate who played for, who plays for Bowling Green Baseball. His team was on verge of being eliminated. Cincinnati men's soccer was eliminated. I, you know, in journalism, we call three a trend, and I yeah. was beginning to see a trend that it's primarily male sports that seem sure. to be impacted at the moment. That may be my perception, and so I was hoping that you guys could give us some clarity on what is the percentage of male versus female sports that are being affected. And, and I think is it, if it is the perception is reality, is that why Title IX is getting some of the blame here? And Andy, I know you responded to that question um, privately. Well, I, I put a link in the Q&A to a great resource, um, and I wish I could remember the names of the guys who are doing it, but if you go to the link, it, it gives them credit, uh, where they are keeping track of every sport at every school that's canceled. When you look at that, that's including schools that have gone out of business, like, like Jack's uh, um, school. So sometimes you'll see every sport canceled as a result. Um, uh, but I think that you're correct. You know, Title IX, people misunderstand all of the nuances of Title IX a lot, and it comes out as a sort of simplistic, if you pay a man a dollar, you pay a woman a dollar. That's not what it says at all. Um, but, but particularly a lot of schools, especially ones with football, have trouble meeting one of the ways you can comply with Title IX, which is to have um, your undergrad male-female ratio be about the same as your athletic participation male-female. But since most universities are majority female, because women are smarter, and most um, uh, most athletic departments are still majority male, it's very hard to meet that, especially if you have a football team with 85 or even 63 scholarship athletes. Um, and so schools rely on a different way to meet it, which is evidence of continuing uh, improvement for the underrepresented gender, which essentially means um, you never cut women's sports and you occasionally add them. The moment you cut one woman's sport, you lose that, that ability to do that. So there's a real disincentive to cut women's sports. The problem is, is so they say, well, we'll cut men's sports, but we're not going to cut the golden gooses of football and basketball. Let's kill all the minor sports. The problem is, is that if you're going to have a football team and if you're going to have that size of a, of a, of a women's uh, program to, to meet your things, those cuts to men's sports do, can often kick you out of compliance on other elements of Title IX, including finan financial proportionality, which is a completely separate part of it. Right. But if you cut a lot of sports with high participation rates and low scholarships rates, like, like you know, all the like men's wrestling, like cross country, where you have a whole bunch of guys and like a sc one scholarship among them, you you grow, you you um, you create a greater disparity between your participation rates and your funding because you've you've gotten the male female rate closer to parity but you haven't changed the funding so the funding is more out of whack right so i think this is a big problem that the schools that think because as dave mentioned at the beginning this is really important title nine is not self-enforcing there's not a title nine uh inspector who comes around and sniffs things out you know you only get in trouble if somebody complains or sues so schools are being proactive they think let's get ourselves in a spot where if we get sued we're fine but in reality, they're actually more out of whack after these cuts to male sports. And then if you combine that with the fact that a lot of these male sports are actually generating cash, but the accounting is getting it wrong, it's like you're cutting money, you're creating greater liability, and you're, you're you know, essentially harming a bunch of these male athletes just to make things worse. There's this, um, this comedy sketch act that my dad uh, got me hooked on from the 1960s, where at one point they say, what we need at this point of the war is a futile gesture. <laughs> and 
that's what it feels like is going on here. What we need at this point in the, in the pandemic is to, you know, to a futile gesture that harms our finances, harms our compliance with the law, and also is just downright mean. That, that's a, that'll fix things. Absolutely. And I just wanted to follow up. I think, you know, what Andy's saying about the win-win is, was interesting on the Knight Commission webinar, it was talked about to where there are a lot of ADs out there saying, you know, we should be able to combine, you know, the, like using the Dak Prescott example and the, the Chunky Soup example. I tend to think, you know, kind of thinking forward that this is going to be an evolving process and knowing how much that these ADs and, and presidents want to see revenue, that I could see something like that eventually happening. But again, when it does, will we have the administration that will be able to manage it from a Title IX and equity perspective, or are we going to hack away at other sports? And then my concern, Nicole, is, as I've talked to you about many times, is what's going to happen then, because we don't really have models outside the educational space to develop athletes for our national teams and international competition in many sports beyond uh, the educational space. Even though we have USA Wrestling, their wrestlers are coming through college. Right. Yeah, if I could just add one thing. Someone in, in the questions asked, why don't the pro sports help more? And an issue is that, you know, professional wrestling is you know, a completely different thing. You know, they're not interested in helping wrestling. There's not a lot of money <laughs> U.S. in like in professional swimming, for right. example. There's more in, in, in Europe and, and other parts of the world. I think the United States should recognize that we as a country have been essentially mooching off of higher education to fund our Olympic programs. And that the answer should be that we all as taxpayers should pay more to develop Olympic sports. If we want to win the Olympics, if that's an important goal for us as a country, then we should pay for it. And if we want to run that money through universities, as we think that's the best way to do it, that's fine. If instead we want to set up an academy system, right. that's fine too. But I, I hate the excuse that, um, well, right now what we're doing is we're generating profits with football. We're growing the profits by not paying the athletes. We're taking the money that would have gone to those athletes and we're paying for coaches and other sports um, and uh, so that we can help America win the Olympic medals. It's like, why are these 85 football players and these 13 male basketball players, why are they responsible for funding our Olympic effort? Great question. Shameless uh, plug, Nicole, that I talk yes. about all these things. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Just exactly what Andy said I talk about in my book that Absolutely. it's very, why are we doing that? And we do need to look at different alternatives in America. Well, I am curious, you know, Jack and I, you have the benefit of hindsight now. And while you were going through the recruiting process and making your selection, um, and real quick, that alarm was the fact that we have another curfew here in the city of Columbus, so nothing major. Um, can you tell me what you would have done, if anything, differently? Or now that you're looking back on it, is there any moment that you remember going, that seemed weird, or maybe I should have thought that something could be in jeopardy? And, and it kind of goes to a question that Addie uh, is asking, are there red flags that people need to be kind of looking at? And so I'm going to throw that question to Dave and Andy, but I want to throw for you guys first. If, in hindsight, is there something that you saw that concerns you or things that you should have been concerned by now that you know what happened? Next, uh, Io, you want to start? Yes, I may have to leave after this as well. Okay, sure. Go ahead. One. But um, more than anything, it was crazy because our coach was the one telling us we're committed, the program's committed, everything, and then it got pulled out. So they weren't even telling him the truth. So right. like sometimes there aren't even red flags because I I had no idea. No one had any idea. We at least thought we had another year. So. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. If we don't get yeah. to. Thank you very much for having good me. Luck, good uh, luck next year and thereafter too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jack, what about you? Uh, I mean, yeah, same for me. Like um, for Banner, for like the men's volleyball team, it was like a first year program. So like that was definitely the last thought of our coach was like after one year, after going through all that, he's just going to like pull the plug. So definitely I didn't see any signs um you know like the university was going up I guess just the whole coronavirus and paying people back for their money with like the dining hall and stuff like that I guess that's what pushed it over but I didn't see anything that was like a a head shake or anything I mean you know Dave and, and Andy I, I I guess part of me was incredulous and you know, I, I, I mean, my son went to, and Jack went to high school and I remember the excitement of him, you know, making this selection and getting to continue his athletic career. 
Um, and it just feels like what was once a sure thing isn't anymore. You know, there was, there was the idea you wouldn't make a team, but the idea that a team would just disintegrate or a university would disintegrate, those things didn't really seem real to all of the high school students that I've ever known across time. It seems pretty real now. So what, what should high school seniors and juniors be doing as they're trying to make these decisions? You know, does, does everybody have to go to a, a, a public school that appears to be well-funded enough? Can you not count on a private school to be able to stay in business or to have the sports you need? How do we prepare students moving forward for this particular uncertainty? Well, I know one thing I used to say, Nicole, um, and I know it's probably not the best thing, but um, I would have a lot of kids, uh, specifically when I worked at Marshall, a lot of kids who wanted to play football. And, and candidly, you know, they just weren't good enough. And they were upset that they, you know, why can't I be on the team? Why? And I go, well, this isn't really a participatory model here. You know, we're, it's, it's essentially a business model. And so we just, and we can't carry unlimited amount of people on the team because of Title IX and monetary reasons. And so I would tell the kid, you know, do you want to play football or do you want to go to Marshall? Because you can't do both here, but if you want to play football, we can find a place for you and help guide you to, and it might be a club football team, but, or it might be a division three school or an NAIA school. We can find a place for you. But if you're really committed to the school and I'm like, I want to go here, my friends are here, my girlfriend's here, boyfriend, whatever it may be, then you can do that. But football is likely not going to be a part of it. And if that's the case, what else, can, what else, do you want to do or can you play is there another sport you could do a lot of people who are athletic can do you know maybe you can be a walk-on on the cross-country team or you know something else or be a practice player for the women's basketball team there's all kinds of different options so that's what i would tell kids is just to understand they that it may not it may not be what you want and you have to figure out what your priority absolutely um Andy. this is pretty boring and i don't I, I, my parents, I'm sure, didn't do this. I didn't do it for any of my kids. But, you know, if you're concerned, I think you should ask them, to ask to see their most recent accreditation report. A lot of times they'll mention financial health as a risk factor. And so, you know, you don't want to, it's like you don't want to do business with someone that gets a, like, barely passing Better Business Bureau rating <laughs> if you can avoid it. And so, you know, maybe that's going to become more important. Um, Dave and Nicole, you're probably around the same age as I am. I'm a Gen Xer, an early Gen Xer, and uh, my whole childhood was everything shutting down. All the baby boom had gone, my elementary school shut, and then, you know, and then they consolidated the, because there were fewer of us, and um, they turned it all into senior housing. <laughs> and then now they had, then, then the millennials came and they had to rebuild it all. So I think Gen Z should just expect to be like Gen X and be the, the, the forgotten sec, you know, second fiddle generation a little bit, that's gonna mean you have to be a little bit smarter. Um, I think Dave's advice is, is good too, is, is if what's most important to you is playing a sport and it has to be varsity, then there's trade-offs. But don't forget that like club rugby is pretty, is a, is a, if you're a football player and you can't play football, you could find a lot of happiness with pro, club rugby, which um, probably also won't impinge on your studies as much. Um, so, you know, there are ways to stay active, um, and there are, you know, sometimes you can't have it all, but there are ways to have it most. Absolutely. Well, we have one last question here from Tony. He's asking about schools having incentives to keep sports, to keep graduation and GPAs up. So, for example, the OSU men's volleyball team has a dozen athletes with high GPAs, nearly 100% graduation. So what will be the effect if we start eliminating some sports that uh, maybe are, are, do have um, student athletes that are, you know, high academic achievers? How will that affect the, that particular bottom line of a university? Dave? Well, the NCAA's academic metrics, which I'm not a big fan of, the academic progress rate, is done by team. Um, and so, you know, if you, it, it's more of a public relations aspect. If you are eliminating men's volleyball or, or high achieving academic teams, um, it's, it's not going to look as good from your public relations perspective because um, I'm sure Ohio State, every time men's volleyball has their APR at 1,000 or close to 1,000, they're going to advertise that. And it looks really, really good. Um, so as far as eliminating teams, that that's somehow going to hurt an overall academic standing within the NCAA spectrum, that's really not going to be the case. And, you know, let's be honest, for the most part, um, most of your high resource schools, at the very least, or most schools, 
we're going to do whatever it takes to keep football, men's basketball, at least above a threshold. Uh, so they won't have any, any punishments like losing a scholarship or money or anything like that. So, and that's why you've seen very few division one football and basketball programs suffer academic penalties. I think UConn and Arizona are the only ones I can think of that have, that have actually had some type of repercussions for uh, APR scores. Yeah, if you look at the end of the bench of a basketball team and you see four guys that look like they should be in study hall rather than on that's the team, point. that's because they're there to boost the GPA. But as, as uh, in the APR and all that stuff, but as Dave pointed out, I think it's pretty much other than being able to say, on average, our athletes get a 3.0. When it comes down to punishments, it's team by team, so that it doesn't yeah. it doesn't buy them too much. Yeah, it, it's a it's it's PR it's PR fluff in a lot of ways, and not to minimize anybody's academic achievement, but but you're right, and you can you can keep a basketball team above the APR threshold by having a couple of GPA boosters on the team, and we've all and we've all seen them. Um, and it's, it's kind of sad when you think about it, but that does happen. I, mean, yeah, I, I know, I know a guy, he's a really high end lawyer. When he was going to college, he was a debater. USC offered him a football scholarship, um, just for GPA purposes and said, you can be on the debate team and just, you know, we're just going to call you a football player. USC he chose to go someplace else. USC has an interesting history as we have seen yeah. in the news recently. <laughs> So, Jack, if you had to offer advice to anybody who's out here, um, get, you know, another, there's another group of juniors at Watterson getting ready to get recruited, what would you tell them? Um, for me, my personal experience, um, I started my recruiting process late. So, I mean, honestly, just get started as early as you can. Um, talk to as many schools as possible. And honestly, don't shut down any schools too early. You want to always keep your options open in case, like, worst case scenario, something happens, an injury or something like that. But, like, honestly, just look at a school. Like, for me personally, if, if you see yourself, if you're looking at a school seriously, like, would you like the school if you got hurt or, like, you weren't playing? Because that's, like, the, one of the most important things. Like, for me, I wish somebody would have told me is, like, if you get hurt or you get cut or something goes wrong, are you still going to be able to like the school? That's a great point. Well, we couldn't end any better. Gentlemen, I am just privileged to have spent this time with you and so grateful for your insights. I will post, uh, we'll post this video uh, by the uh, beginning part of next week. And with it, I will post the resource that Andy gave us um, that shows the different schools that are and the programs that have been cut if anyone is interested. I hope that you will uh, join me in thanking these amazing men and also in joining me next week when we welcome Katie Smith. She will be here on Thursday at three o'clock to talk about uh, women's basketball, her career, her pathway, and uh, you know, really just kind of life in general and, and where we are now amid COVID-19 and, and all types of other subjects that we're gonna talk about. So I hope that you'll join us. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure and I wish everyone to stay healthy and stay. Healthy.